Okay, so we're starting out. I'm conscious we've got to, to move quickly. Um, we're not going to be moving too quickly on this topic, though, because um, it's quite important and I want you to understand it quite well. So if we have to spend this week, the rest of this week, and some of next week doing this topic, then that's also fine. Okay. okay. It's not that boring, surely. <laughs> Me that's tired, that's the one. Okay, no problem. Right, so, that maximum to understanding. Mark Retty. Okay, this is a quote from his, uh, I think, 1992 Ace Communications with the Asian Man article. So, <coughs> what this is all about is how can we hang our knowledge somewhere? What knowledge do we need to be able to create systems, design systems, build systems? What knowledge do we need to be able to talk to the software engineers? And what language do we need to be able to, to do the translation between people and technical people, software engineers? Okay, that's what this is all about. Now, mostly, you, we get focused on this old school um, requirements analysis stuff by asking for the functionality. We all think about the functionality, how it's going to be done, how it's all going to fit together. Okay? But not what is it that's required, what do we need and why. Okay? So this is something that we need to address, remedy. So who's done any requirements analysis, requirements solicitation? At all before. Okay? So a few of you have, but not that many. Okay. So a while ago, and still in some places, um, Software engineering was characterised, certainly the requirements analysis phase and the solicitation phase, was characterised by two things, functional and non-functional requirements. Okay? That's what we would come up with at the end, a big list of functional things we wanted to do and non-functional things we wanted to do. And the non-functional things were things which were more, well, difficult to put a handle on, so we'd, go, we'd say, oh, it needs to look nice, or you know, it needs to have you know, sort of these kind of colours or a new company logo. And we didn't do a very good job of this, and maybe we didn't do a very good job, is because it's more difficult, it's less tangible, okay, these non-functional requirements. Functional requirements, if it's an air traffic control system, yeah, we've got to track a plane, blah, blah, okay, that's kind of, we can do that, we know what we need to do for functionality for that. It's a very easy thing to think about, but how do we need to increase the, well, increase the situational awareness of the controller, the radar controller, for instance, is more difficult because it's more difficult to actually decide what that means, okay, and whether they want it, what are their problems. So, this is what it is. Now, Cato um, created some kind of loop for, to, to help us try and understand better the kind of cycle that we need, okay. So this is called the awareness, understanding and action cycle. Okay? So here we have to create an awareness in ourselves of what people want. We have to really understand what people want, and then we have to do some action about it. We have to have some action. So you can see the cycle comes in where we've got this information needed. Okay, so this might be a brand new system, or as with most systems, it might be a maintenance job. Okay, so as we know, as good software engineers, you all are, 70% of um, all software engineering is maintenance. Yeah? In fact, more than that, okay. so, But most of the central point of view, the software engineering is maintenance, not creation. Okay? That's why you need to come and go. So, um, we've got some information in here. Oops. We've got some information in here. And then we need to have some purpose. What's the purpose of this information? How should it fit together? And we've got some information outcome. Now, here, we've got some choices and some actions that we can have. So, here, We've got different kinds of prototypes in our language, user experience language, we can have different kinds of prototypes, different kinds of um, way of evaluation methodologies to understand what the user wants, what the user's satisfaction is. Okay? Are they satisfied with this? And we've got some actions that we'll go through to understand um, if user satisfaction occurs. <coughs> now this slide we're going to look at in about the left hand side, the right hand side. We're going to look at in, ooh, well, after.
after Easter actually, because after Easter we didn't look at how to do evaluations properly and how to understand what user satisfaction might be. But we can do stuff right now in user in requirements analysis because we can kind of, if we ask them questions, if we understand what their needs are, then we can kind of hopefully do something about those needs before they um, before there's a before there's a problem with the actual evaluation. Okay, we don't let it we don't need to let it get to the evaluation stage before we have to make corrections. Okay. Okay, so here we come down to a system, in this case, Cato talks about websites, but that's not what we're necessarily talking about, it's any user experience stuff. <coughs> and then from this system we get some awareness and some understanding about user knowledge, okay? So this is in the user knowledge domain. So we can understand what, we can become aware what the user wants, what their knowledge requirements are, because this system will start to fail if we've created it, and it's wrong. So we can see that they don't, we can become aware of it, and then we can understand just what it is we need to do. What additional things we need to code, what additional pieces of information, knowledge, interactive components, procedures, tasks, we need to actually capture as part of our model. Okay, and then it goes around the cycle again. Until we come to this information outcome here, which is likely to, to actually only, only happen for, at a version level. So we get to a certain version, we get this information outcome, and then we'll have to start again because we're going to get a new version of the Okay. So the process by which we kind of go through this bigger cycle is a smaller cycle that Kento talks about, which is this is design, discover, and use. Discover, design, and use. Okay. So this is something that, that as user experience people, you're going to do all the time. So Penny. Penny Allen from the BBC, when she came to talk to us, spoke about, she didn't speak about it in these terms, this, this um, discover, design and use terms, but she actually did, dis did discuss this in what she was actually saying. She was saying that we discover stuff, remember how she said, we do what we need to have, we need to become experts very quickly on a subject and we have to read lots of papers in the first few weeks so we can actually create some experiments. Do you remember that? If you don't remember that, you can look at it in the video, but that's what she said. Yeah? And then... We have to do some design, okay? We have to, we have to do some more discovery um, at the very end, if you like, because we're talking to people, we're discovering what they need. And then we have to do some design. So remember she was talking about the design for the font system for the BBC, what's, what the font should be like. So we should do some design for that, design for the fonts. And then she used it with people, okay? And then it actually got used in, in reality with designers. So there's this cycle that we go through. Now, I would add to this cycle, as we'll see, We've got that because this is just part of the previous cycle. Okay. I would add here that we need to use and then we need to evaluate. So we've got this evaluation or evaluation in use, okay. which also we'll see about in just after Easter. Okay. How we evaluate these things. So here we've got this choices, we make a design, we evaluate it, we, have, we get some objectives out, we explore some more about what the user wants, and then we have some choices to make and we go back into the design cycle. So this explore part is really what we're going to be talking about, the exploring the choices here in these lectures, okay, the, in this, these next few, this, this next hour or, well, and uh, maybe now next week, okay? Okay, oops. So, in the old days, <coughs> what we used to do, and still, as I keep saying, in lots of companies, it's all a bit like Agile, we'll say we do this participatory and we'll use a certain design, but nobody ever does because it's more difficult to do, it's more time consuming to do. So what people, what, what people used to do is we used to fetch up into a company, sit down, we used to have individuals come to us and say, this is what I want. And we used to write it down. Yeah, that's, right. that's the requirement. It needs to do this, it needs to do that, it needs to do the other. And we miss out a lot of information because there's a lot of implicit information that they don't tell you. There's lots of information whereby there's a political reason for them not telling you it, or there's a political reason for them to actually forget about it conveniently, okay, because it's part of the process that they do now, they just don't want to do it anymore. The managers want it, but they don't, okay. There's lots of reasons. I've gone into so many companies where I used to do this professionally, and you go there, and generally they've got no real, you know, clue about what it is, the managers don't have any real clue about what it is the actual users do, okay, or want to do. The implicit 
nature of things is that, that lots of things are left unsaid. Lots of things are said because the manager might be sitting right there in the interview with, that you're having with this person. Okay? So you can't actually talk to people freely necessarily because they're misleading the company line. And they're missing out a lot of information while they're doing it. So you can create the best model you like. You can create a great list of functional requirements, but it's still wrong. It may, might make you feel good, it might make your managers feel good, it might make their managers feel good, but it's still wrong. Okay? So this is something we try to address in this user-centered or participatory design. Okay? Whereby we have the users, or we go, we have the users there in focus groups where managers often aren't. Okay? They come for day for a day. Maybe they're in, maybe we have interviews with them, maybe we have um, observational sessions or observational periods, which we'll get to. Okay? Whereby they're just doing their jobs every day. You just sit there and you're taking notes, you're trying to understand what are these jobs that they're doing. Okay? Now, it's often difficult to explicitly understand that, so you need lots of different methods to be able to get the richness of information to you from them. Okay? Because as I say, there's lots of things that are unsaid, there's lots of things that, that people are not necessarily truthful about directly. Okay? So, but the point of this is that at least if the users are involved in the design process, they get to say, well, we don't do this now, but we would like to do it. This functionality would help me do my own job better, even though it's not there right, right now. Um, you might see that emergent behaviour occurs such that there's lots of little um, activities outside the main or sanctioned process that go on to help them get their jobs done better. Okay? Where these things what can't, aren't documented. So, um, BS5750 is quality procedure. Has anybody heard of BS5750 or ISO 9000? Yeah? Okay, so these are quality procedures to allow procedures to be done as good as possible every time. And, you know, if somebody goes off sick, they can go and get the documentation out and do that procedure with as good a quality as any people. The problem with this is that the procedure is then quite fixed. That these little things that occur outside of the actual procedure, the, the formal procedure, get lost, get left. Okay? And we don't get to see those things. If we, if we look at their quality procedures and say, oh, this is how they do, the, do things, then unfortunately things get, things get missed. So what you're looking for as you experience people is all the little things that help them get their jobs done that they're not going to tell you about explicitly. Okay? Yes? So being a software engineer ourselves who are primary, primary asked to do the system functionality aspect of yeah. it, uh, we're not becoming a super nanny for them, are we? Oh, do you have this TDD issue with your manager? You're not telling us. If you don't tell us, you don't get it. I, in sort of more extreme terms. Right, but that's not the point of that's not the point of this because it's not quite. I mean, that's quite a confrontational view, and that's why you know that kind of the sort of a more confrontational view like that, we say you don't tell, you don't get, is why we have um, functionality creep. Why that you can write all of the actual um, uh, design specifications you like. But you'll still find that after the program, after the system goes out, the company isn't happy and they want additions, they want changes. The reason why they want those changes is because we've missed it at this point. So, what we need to think about is how can we make this occur correctly? Okay. So, you're right, we're not going to be managed for anybody, but what we are going to do is ask the question. Okay. So, or, or not, and if we don't ask you the question, we're going to observe them. We're going to see what they really do, not what they say they do, what do they really do? Yes. But this all depends on the assumption that what people want or what people already do is what they actually need to solve their problem. That's right. It, and that's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true. So that's why we have a multiple set of methods which puts the user at the centre so that they can do a number of things. We can see what they do. They can tell us about what they'd like. They can tell us their frustrations. They can tell us um, if there's changes or alterations or things that are dangerous maybe in the system. If they want to. If they're able to. What we're trying to do with participatory design is to give them the opportunity to do it where, where that wasn't happening before because they were very much brought to, brought to us. What do you need? This functionality, go away, next, kind of thing. Yeah? That's, that's how it normally happens. So we'll see that in a while. It's a good point though. Just because people do it now doesn't mean to say that's what they want to do in the future. Yeah? It's also, it, 
it's also the case that they might want to be presented with some options because they don't know what all the options are. Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously there's the um, famous Ford quote from, well, bizarre quote from Henry Ford. You know, if you'd have asked what people wanted, they'd have said a faster horse and cart. When really, you know, we just decided to design a car instead. Yeah. So they have to know these options and what's available. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is who. Okay, so we need to find out who are the people. So generally, and this is generally, and you can alter this once you get experience. For all of this, nothing replaces experience. Okay? Your experience. So once you're experienced at doing these user evaluations, it'll be up to you to build new ones. Okay? It'll be up to you to, do, to, to decide which is appropriate in which context. This isn't something where we just write it down and we follow that slavishly. It's for you to decide. We're, I'm giving you a set of tools. The combination of those tools that you use them in will give you a certain richness of result. Yeah? And you might want to modify those based on the situation that you're in at the time. Okay, so who are this for? So we've got actors. So it refers to a specific instance of the user, such as a customer, a manager, or a sales clerk. So these are people, these are actors in the system. They're going to be really the users in a lot of ways. Okay? Stakeholders. So these might be people who are not directly involved, but they still have a stake. So these might be managers who have a stake in the system. They want something from it, or they want it to occur, but they're not going to use it every day. So they're not going to use it a lot, probably. Okay. Um, role. Okay. So, describe the person who the user will be taking. So, are they a manager? Are they uh, um, you know, somebody who's doing some kind of business analysis function, some business analysis job? Are they a sales person? Kind of thing. That kind of role. What is, their, what is the role that they're doing? And that's linked to the actor, quite, linked, quite closely linked to the actor. And then we've got this thing called proxy. Used to describe a person who's not really doing, who's not doing the job that they're being the actor for. So it's used to describe a person who's not a specific user, but is playing that role. So they're kind of fake, if you like, a fake person. Okay? Now, I've given you these because I want you, because these are kind of a bit more difficult to understand. You know, the, the, relies on certain terminology from requirements engineering language. What? So I want now, five minutes, and I'm going to be strict. I want you to get into little clusters of people. Uh, everybody should have friends, and if you haven't, now's the time to make them. Um, I, want to, I want you to just quickly jot down the what's. So what is required from these people? What do we think would be required that we want? That we want as user requirements people? What's the what that we want? What do we want from them? <coughs> Yeah? Are we class spending in all four different ones or just a collective? Just list? a collective, big collective list of things that we want. What is it that we what is it? <laughs> if you haven't got a friend, I can match make. <laughs>
Uh, the business value, they have to choose. Yeah. Any more? Yes. Uh, strate strategic vision and direction. Okay, any more? What are you all talking about? What are you doing tonight? Or what you did last night? There was lots of conversation. Where's all the data? Time frame. Okay. Any more? Yes. Okay. Uh, the training provided and the turnover. Training and the? the uh, the turnover, like how the okay. new person is going to be using the software. Any more? Yes. I'm sorry, you just. What did work in the past? Yep, any more? Yes. Their wants and their clients wants. Yep. This is an extension, so they do as well. So. Oh, do. Interest. Just interest. For a company? No. Sure. Right, okay. So, I don't know how to camera. <coughs> um, okay, that's good, actually. I'm glad we've got that. We've got more, we've got a, a lot of different ones, different ones to mine. Uh, some of them are some of them, uh, different ones to mine. Some of them are, uh, I mean, a lot of these are like with the, even the money one. You know, at least it's uh, showing a bit of original thought, thinking differently. That this is, you know, we want money, we want uh, things like um, what's the time frame, and these kind of things, okay, priorities. So these are kind of general planning scenarios. So I've got things like current system. What does the current system do? Maybe based on what? So what what kind of work goes on? The current documentation. So we need the current documentation if we can, because then we can actually understand what people think should be happening, okay, or how things should work. Or if people have put little post-it notes into that documentation to say this is a load of crap, okay. Um, improvements. What improvements could be mad? <laughs> Who knows? What improvements could be mad? Um, what changes, additions, subtractions are required? So what's the, you know, what kind of <coughs> and importance? And what's important, what needs speed, what uh, is less often used, and what is the schedule? So what's less, less often used, why does that matter? Yes? It's got a lower priority. It's got a lower priority, but also it may have a lower priority away from the interface. Okay, so therefore you might want to, you want, you might want to put that back. In somewhere else in the interface, and you don't want you don't want it right up front to put up the screen. Yes. I was just going to say prominence. Prominence, yeah, good point. Okay. You will also need to have, it says, a plan for design, agile participatory development, and handling feature creep. So this this bit at the bottom is probably most important when it comes to running, okay, and also the uh, time frame. So this kind of idea of feature creep is something that you really need to uh, get a handle on. So have you all heard of feature creep? Yeah, you all know, yeah? So therefore, <coughs> feature creep is really, um, as a few of you haven't heard of it, feature creep is whereby you enact your system and then you slowly start to get more and more and more and more feature requests because they can see the benefits. Okay? And they're 
the, the thing about agile development is that it can handle those features that feature creep quite well because obviously you're doing something in you know you're doing very fast um, development cycles. Okay, but where, where new functionality can be added at any particular time. But the point is, or requirements for new functionality anyway. But the point being is that that in the end is going to take you more time to create. Okay, which means that your total time frame, there's always a finite time frame for the development itself, always. Yeah, so there'll, there'll always be a point where the people say, that's, that's, the, the client says, that's enough, I'm going to pay you now, and go away. That will always occur. So some stuff will end up being implemented, and some stuff will end up not being implemented. But the point is that this feature can, can mean that, that features that are, are required might not be in the system, but features that people want might be in the system because they want them more, so they talk about it more, so you get this feature creep, which means that, that, that it's difficult sometimes to understand what's a really key requirement and what isn't, okay? because people will prioritise what they want more than what is definitely required sometimes. Okay. okay. So, if you've read, well, you haven't read because I've been just given it to you, but this hack acts for understanding thing, you'll see that I create, that I, I actually write on page 97, this is a love song to the post it note. The humble post it note is brilliant. It's what we, be, it's what we should be using in most of our designs, or at least for representing a lot of the designs, because it's very flexible. Okay? It doesn't scare away people if you give them a, box, a, a packet of post-it notes when you go to um, an interview session or you go to a focus group or you go to um, other kind of corporation. If you fetch up with a computer with lots of complicated software like you're trying to fill in, then that can be a problem. Okay? If you've got some official looking form that you want people to fill in with their names and everything on it, that could be a problem because you can put people off, they can only say certain things. If you've got an award that's anonymous, that they're not, they're not going to write their names on, they're just going to have their post-it note and they're going to say, what are the features we want? And they can stick it in. What features don't work? They can stick it on. It's anonymous. We don't know. We can't link back who said that. So therefore, they're far more likely to want to actually help you with the design by doing this. It also means that you can all stand around and look at it on your wall. And it also means that you can rearrange parts of the wall or parts of the post-it note to a more accurately represent Features that may be similar or, li or linked or, or um, aspects which are important or less important, just as you like. Okay, so it's got a very flexible feeling. The main part in participatory design, in my opinion, is this aspect that they're not threatening. And you'll find that when you go into these organisations, oftentimes, you're seen as being the sort of um, the expert, if you like. That you're there, and therefore, because you're the expert, you have more knowledge than the user, and therefore, they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. Yeah? Because you're the expert, you know best. Well, that's not what we want. So, therefore, post it notes are quite a leveler. They level the field out, they're very flexible, and they're really easy to use. So, that's why you should think of them beyond things like that. And, of course, the other positive point is that with post it notes, when you take them off the wall and you start to learn to translate that into more formal language, it allows you to reread them again. It allows you to, just, to think about them yourself and interpret them and understand how you interpret them. Whereas if it's all just typed into a computer right at the time, there's no chance for reflection about, for, on, for you about what your interpretation has been or what's being created. Yeah? So that's why I post it next right Okay. So, how do we do this? Well, in general, we observe. Okay? We then analyse and then we then discuss. So we can observe, we look at what people do and note it down. Yeah? That's exactly what Fanny was doing in a lot of those uh, BBC experiments. And you'll see that if we, if we get uh, um, ThoughtWorks to come and talk to us, that's what, they, that's what they'll be doing too. Yeah. Um, analysis. So then you analyse the stuff that's produced. Now, obviously, in this analysis is your interpretation. Your interpretation, because you know the technical field, but you also have got to interpret this from what the people have said. They might not know how to actually express it in technical terms properly. Okay. However, what's the negative point of this analysis aspect? 
that you're going to do this analysis? Yes. Do you know what results you're trying to get to? Do you know what results you're trying to get to? So there's always the danger that you're going to be biased in your analysis, so you're going to interpret the things according to you. Yeah? Which means that the, the real part, the real knowledge is lost because it's some kind of knowledge that, that's contained within you. It's just wrapped onto this interpretive analysis that's going on. And then we've got discuss, and we're trying to find out what these observations and analysis mean. So this discussion aspect might be internally within your software engineering team, or it might include the users. With participatory design, it will include the users. So you'll say, well, this is what I think. Am I right? Is this, is, are we getting on the right track here? And then we design together. Yeah? OK. No coffee break. Um, so there's, there's two different types of, in fact, no coffee break, but there's two different kinds of analysis, maybe, data collection. Not analysis, but data collection and different kinds of data analysis. So what are those two kinds? There was one, yes. Quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative and qualitative. And what do those, what does quantitative mean and what does qualitative mean? Quantitative is something you can actually measure. Yeah. And um, qualitative is how it makes you feel, how you, how you uh, what your experience of the uh, normal thing is. Yeah, that's right. So the qualitative stuff also is maybe something that you can't measure directly. So it's not just about necessarily emotions or how you make you feel. It could be lots of different stuff, but it's just something that's not measurable directly. So. Let's look at qualitative first, because in the scenario where we're gathering information from them to try and inform our design and then development, we're much more interested in rich information. You'll find that qualitative information is quite narrow, but quite deep. And you'll find that quantitative information is obviously quite broad, but quite shallow. Okay, the amount of information you get back from that is quite shallow. And this is because in quantitative information, for instance, you've got a questionnaire, well, you've decided what questions you're going to ask somebody. You've decided what numbers they're going to use to rate things. So you've already made some assumptions because you're asking questions which have made some assumptions. Yeah? With those assumptions contained within them. So that's what you've got to consider. Now, qualitative, you'll see this in here, it's en vivo tool. Now, as I've said before, we've got this thing in qualitative analysis where we do a certain kind of analysis of of anything, in this case it's, a, it's, an, it's an auditory and uh, interview. But, what kind of, what, what thing do we do in qualitative analysis mainly when it comes to large bits of written work or uh, interview data? We transcribe it and then we do something to it. We code it, okay? But we don't code it as computer scientists, as we've been discussing previously. We code it in the same way that, say, an anthropologist codes it, by looking at categories or repeated concepts. So we categorise repeated concepts, normally, through all the different participants to see whether there's some similarity of experience or similar similarity of understanding. Okay? So if we can do this, we can then use those categories to maybe get a bit more information or maybe quantitative information by adding a survey based on those categories. But qualitative is something that you should be thinking about doing from the very start on all these requirements of dissertation. Okay, now, if you've got six months, an anthropologist would be having a heart attack right now if I said you could do this in six months. Because they want to, they, if, you know, if you, can, if you can do it in two years, then they're happy, normally. So this six months bit is just because I'm, with, I'm uh, changing it from user experience because there's no way we're going to be sitting in an organisation uh, looking at the same kind of thing for two years. It's just not going to happen. In fact, we're not going to be looking at doing it for six months either, often. Okay? But the first thing is participant observation. Okay? So this is where we're observing participants, observing people doing whatever they decide they're doing at the time. This participant observation came from the way, from anthropology, from the way of making ethnographies whereby we'd go out to some far away country and, in the worst case, sit on a veranda and ask people to uh, come and talk to us, but in the best case we'd just go and live with the people. Okay? And what we do is we participate in their everyday life. And the same is true here. Often it's good if you can go and do, be part of a coding team, and do or be part of a user team, 
and do the same kind of jobs that a user might be doing of your system. Okay? So, so that you're integrated into that system. So you learn, in this case, we learn by doing the job, generally. We learn what the problems are by doing it, by observing the people around us doing that job, by observing their frustrations, by having our frustrations ourselves. And that's why it takes a long time. Because it takes a while for them to forget you're actually here to observe them, not as a, not as a, a real worker, if you like, okay? even though you might be doing that job. Um, so it's long term, and you need to interpret what you're getting back. Now, taking notes in this context is quite difficult, and there's books about how you should take notes, aren't you? Yes, you can believe it. There are books about how you should take these notes. Some, of, some people suggest that the best way is to sit there with a pad and take everything copiously, but that means that you're then distanced from the situation. Other people say it's best if you do it in half hour segments, whereby you excuse yourself, you need a toilet break or a fag break or whatever it is, you run off and make quick notes about what's happened in that half an hour segment, okay, on a bit of paper. And then when you get home at night, you transcribe them to some kind of electronic tool. Now that transcribing is called note scraping, okay, so you're scraping your notes from written handwork, handy written stuff, uh, to some kind of electronic system, yeah? <coughs> Um, it's embedded or it's embedded. So, as you heard of embedded, which means it's embedded and invisible. So, this kind of work you should be invisible. There's lots of work being done in Manchester and in Chicago, bizarrely, um, where the main ethnography schools are. Um, um, for, for well, two big ethnography schools anyway, whereby they're mostly interested in well, what we used to be called deviancy. So, they would uh, go with say drug users, interviews drug users, and just kind of act as just part of the group, gang culture, part of the gang, okay, that kind of thing. So in this case, it's invisible. You become invisible after a while. Yes, not. What is that? Ethnography? ethnography is where you. So it's, part, it's a discipline of anthropology, and it's where you're actually creating a set of or a story based on your experiences um, with a set of users, if you like, or a set of people. So therefore, you've been anthropologist. You want to understand more about, say, drug use in Manchester. You go with a load of drug users in Manchester and just integrate there for two years, constantly writing these notes, and at the end of that, you'd write a thesis, which is called an ethnography. Now, you can also do one, do ones using videos, so you can have video ethnographies and those kind of things. It's kind of a step away from doc documentary work, if you like. Yes. Um, in, in terms of software, um, isn't isn't this kind of persistent observation thing? Is that only really valuable for iterative improvement rather than a reinvention of the of the solutions? It can be. Yes. Uh, so it it just depends about iterative. So iterative or reinvention. I think it's it's good for both. And the, one of the reasons is, I mean, the likelihood is, in honesty, the likelihood is that you're never going to get six months to do this. But you might be able to use some of the techniques in participant observation to observe and to be away and distanced in the shadows, if you like, from what's going on, so you don't influence it too much. Uh, but you still get the rich data. Now, with regard to creating a fresh, I've seen um, people go into um, organisations where it's a paper-based organisation, or it's, just, uh, it's kind of a combination of stuff. Is that an iterative development if you're going to make it a new computer system? Well, kind of. It's an iterative development of the process, but it's not an iterative development of any software. So, I don't know. Yeah, I mean... When we create anything, unless it's absolutely fresh, it's kind of an iterative development if you want to see it like that, on the process at least. So, um, the key aspect of what you'll find that anthropologists talk about, and one of us talk about, is this conversations with a purpose. So, you have some ideas. When you see somebody and you observe somebody doing stuff, you know, listening <coughs> to music or whatever they might be, you think, hmm, that seems like this. You've gone away. You've gone for a toilet break and you've taken your notes and you think, oh, here's a hypothesis. I think this bit of work here is about this. So you then start look to them at the cooler, at the water cooler, and say, hey, that bit of work you're doing. You know, you start a conversation about something, but it has a purpose, even though it might not be completely obvious to the person who you're talking to that it has a purpose. It has a purpose to you. Yeah? So that means that you can confirm a hypothesis or some kind of understanding by not explicitly asking them, because it might be that they've got more, you don't want to close down the conversation directly, they've got more to say than just, is this the case? Yes. 
You know, they've got more to say than that, maybe. That they'll be able to expand on it, elaborate on it. So that's why it's called conversation with purpose. Um, strategies to not stand out. That's one of the other things that we need to consider. Let me just finish this slide. Okay, so task analysis. Here, instead of learn by, learn by doing, we're learning by observing much more. Okay, now I've written six months here, got six months, and task analysis would be really nice. We have six months to do it in, but we don't have six months to do it in, mostly, oftentimes. So, again, it's going to be, it, task analysis is far more short term because you're far more directed, you're interested in tasks, you're interested in analysing the tasks, you're not much bothered about the richness of data or information surrounding those tasks, only the tasks themselves, which might mean that you lose stuff, you lose information. Okay? But it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. You have to pragmatically trade this off. Um, so it can be remote. So we did some work remotely whereby we just sat in Starbucks in the train centre. We wanted to look at mobile phone usage and how people used phones when they were walking. And we just observed 400 people doing it. Okay, and then as we went, we created a framework from this observation so we could see the kind of tasks and, and categorise those kind of tasks. Turns out that uh, people take five steps on average by texting between uh, looking up and re reasserting uh, and looking down again at the text that they're doing, strangely. Uh, and they follow edges. So they'll follow a person who's walking straight ahead, they'll follow those if they possibly can. And then they take uh, eight steps between them looking up or not. Or they follow an edge. Okay? And this was all useful because then we built a, a mobile platform to allow us to support that kind of behaviour on a mobile phone. You can read the papers there. Um, okay, so it's notes but with a formal model of what you're actually noting down. So this side, it's all conversations and discussion. Here it's a bit more formal, we've got a bit more formal, we've got some more formal notes and we'll see those next time. Um, it's le there's less interpretation often because it's kind of qualitative with a bit of quantitative. There's a bit of measure there. Okay, so it's less interpretive. Okay, I'll see you next week. <laughs>